Sunday School lesson for June 4th, which is Lesson 1, coming out of Unit 1, which is titled, Call to Be Strong. And our lesson for June 4th title is, Without a Doubt. Our devotional reading is taken from the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 29 through 40. And our background scripture is from the book of Judges, chapters 4 and 5. And our printed passage is from Judges, the fourth chapter, verses 1 to 10. And our key verse states, She said, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thy honor. For the Lord shall sail Syria into the hands of a woman. Judges chapter 4, verse 9. Our lesson name is for the student to be able to grasp the state of Israel and its changing leadership dynamics during the time of Deborah. Also, to identify with Barak's sense of inadequacy and Deborah's sense of confidence. And to welcome godly counsel and be willing to share such wisdoms with others. Without a doubt. <clears throat> the book of Judges serves a twofold purpose. First, historically, it records the history of the nation Israel from the death of Joshua to Samuel, the last of the judges and the first of the prophets. It bridges the gap between Joshua and the rise of the monarchy. There was no leader to take Joshua's place in the way he had taken Moses' place. The book of Joshua is a book of victory. The book of Judges is a book of defeat. Joshua, the leader, had died, but God remained. There was no necessity for defeat. For we see that the four Fold cycle so common in Israel history, which was rebellion, retribution, repentance, and restoration, occurred repeatedly, time and time again. The book of Judges records the activities of 12 men and one woman, designated as judges and raised up by God to deliver Israel in time of the cleansing and disunion. Israel would time and time again fall into sin. Then God would raise up surrounding nations around them as a rod of chastisement, and then Israel would repent and cry unto God, and then God was, would raise up a judge to deliver them. So this was a, a repeated cycle over and over again. So we find in verses 1 through 3 of our lesson where it states, And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. The Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazar.
the captain of whose host was Syria, who dwelt in Harashet of the nations. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and 20 years he oppressed the children of Israel. It says that the children of Israel did again did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forsook his service and they began to worship idols when Ehu died. Ehu who had kept a, a strict eye upon them and restrained and punished everything that looked towards idolatry and kept them close to God's service. We can find that record in the first three chapters of the book of Judges and how that God had raised him up as a judge and that how he had kept a stern hand upon Israel. But when he was gone, when he died, they revolted. They turned back to their evil ways, fearing him more than they did God. And so we see that when they forsook God and he used the Canaanites as a rod of chastisement against him. These Canaanites were the very people that Israel had defeated under Joshua and which, not, and which they did not totally destroy as God has commanded them. But these very people that they had defeated when they first came into the land, now they had <coughs> regathered themselves, and now they are stronger, and their servitude was longer than any of the others, and that was more grievous that Israel had to face. The very people that God had told them to utterly destroy, they did not, and so now these people had the opportunity over the years to regather themselves and to rebuild their armies, and now they are coming back at Israel's with great of vengeance, even greater of vengeance because why? Because Israel had taken their land, had destroyed them, had, had, had killed their loved ones and, and families, and now they are taking out their vengeance over them, and then they ruled over them grievously for for 20 years and so Israel cried unto the Lord when the distress drove them to him and they saw no other way of relief they saw no other way out so many times we as people you know we you know we go about our business when we are doing well you know, we don't think about God, but then but then when trouble start arising, well, we figure that if we could figure it out or, or we got a friend or somebody that can help us, you know, but then the majority of the time the only time people are turned to God when they figure that 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 is the last option that they have. But but we should rely upon him in all things, in all our ways, we're supposed to acknowledge him and to depend upon him, not just when we are in distress and things are look, looking hopelessly, but, but we should trust in him and depend upon him on everything and every day. Even when the sun is shining, we should praise him and, and exalt him and not just call upon him when we are in distress or or in need. But we see that Israel, Israel now, that things will look hopeless. Now they are turning back to the one who they turned from, the one who had blessed them, the one who had gave them strength to be in that land. But they had sinned against him by worshiping other gods. And so when it got so bad that they had no other choice, they turned unto the Lord. We find in verses 4 of our, 
in five of our lessons where it states, and Deborah of prophecies, the wife of Lapidot, judged Israel at that time. And she dwelt under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim, and the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. Deborah, a prophetess, that that she was, that is, that she was intimately acquainted with God, one that was instructed in divine knowledge by the immediate inspiration of the Spirit of God, and that she had gifts of wisdom, and she was entirely devoted to the service of Israel. She judged Israel, not as a princess by a civil authority, but as a prophetess and as God's spokesperson to them, correcting abuses, redressing grievances, especially those that related to the worship of God. And we are told that the children of Israel came up to her from all parts of Israel for judgment. And we read in verse 6 and 7 of our lesson where it states, And she went and called Barak, the son of Abinamon, out of Kadesh Nathali, and said unto him, Have not the Lord God said to Israel, commanding, saying, Go and draw towards Mount Tabor, and take with the Ten thousand men of the children of Nathali and of the children of Zebulun. And she went and called Barak. We're told here in, in these two verses that by God's directions, she ordered Barak to raise an army, saying it was God's command to raise 10,000 men and to and to and not to fear and that they would and not to fear that they would be too fear too few because God has said that he would be with them to deliver them and that Syria the captain of Jabin's army with his chariots and his army would be the delivered into his hand. Now we have to understand that Syria had chariots. They say they was chariots of iron, which was meant that they was not totally made out of iron, but that they had long iron shafts sticking out the axles of the wheel. That that they protruded out in both directions and they had sharp blades on them. And that when the chariots would would ride through the opposing infantry being pulled by mighty horses, that those blades spinning real fast would would cut up the infantry. That it it would disable and maim those soldiers who was on foot. So this was a mighty weapon at that time. In Israel, in Israel was not Israel did not have a cavalry. Israel was just foot soldiers. They was infantrymen mostly. And so that, and he had over 9,000 of those chariots. And so she was reassuring him that if he raised up 10,000 men, regardless against the, it seemed like the overpowering equipment that Syria had that, that would be enough men for them to have the victory because God would be with them. That the God of Israel that brought them across the Red Sea, that brought them into the land where they defeated Jericho and all those surrounding cities, that God would be with them. And so we find in verse 7, it was she said, I would draw uh, I would draw unto thee 
to the river Kishon, Saria and the captains of Jabin army and his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thy hands. In verse 8, the rock said unto her, If thou will go with me, then I will go. But if thou will not go with me, then I will not go. Barak said to Deborah, If you will go with me, then I will go. Which showed his faith in the word of God for which he is commended as in a readiness to do the will of God and courage to engage in such a work with a powerful adversary. But he also showed that he trusted that Deborah was a spokesperson for God. And so it showed that, that he trusted what she said, but he still needed her presence, her reassurance to be there with him. For he said, but if thou will not go with me, then I will not go. See, we see here his very high opinion that he had of Deborah as the judge of Israel and prophet of the Lord, being desires that he might have her with him to pray to God for him, to give him advice and counsel on any emergency that might arise, she being an article, a spokesman of God. Also, her going with him to prevail upon the inhabitants of Natali and Zebulon to go with him when he went to those two tribes to call up, to, to muster up, to gather up those 10,000 soldiers that he would need, that it wasn't, he wanted proof that he wasn't just speaking this on his own, but he wanted the, the proof that the spoke person of that time for God, which was Deborah, was 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 behind this and that God was with this. This was God's calling and not Barak calling. And so that the people would believe him to go with him. And who he might fear would not believe him or pay any regard to what he had to say because they might have thought it was his words. And then that that's trusting only in him that they might be in fear of engaging with the enemy. But if they seen Deborah's presence, which he felt would satisfy them as to the mind or will that God was in this, that this was God's purpose and motivate them to give them carries. And so we find in verse 9 where it states, And she said, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou hast taken shall not be for thy honor. For the Lord shall sail surreal into the hands of a woman and Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And she said, I will surely go with thee. Deborah made no hesitation about it, but she agreed at once to go with him for his encouragement. But though she appears to go with Barak, she also warns him that because of his insistence that she go with him, that the honor and the glory of the victory will not go to him. For as usually a general, when an army wins a great battle, the victory or the glory goes to the credit of the general. But devil tells him in advance now since you needed me to go with you that you will not receive the honor of the victory but the 
but the honor and the praises and the glory of the victory will be stored upon a woman and instead of you. That's because he would not go by himself, that he needed her support. And because he would not go without a woman, Saria would not fall into his hands, but into the hands of a woman. This is a clear instance of Deborah having a spirit of prophecy. For Saria did die at the hands of a woman, which was Jael. As we read further on in, in, in this uh, uh in this uh, fourth chapter of Judges, from from verses twelve on down, it, it tells about how that the battle took place and that how that Saria fled and that he, how he hid and that it was a woman that that killed him and not Barak, and so and, and so we see so she. So she gives him this insight as they depart to go to do the will of the Lord. And so we find in verse 10, and it says, And Barak called Zebulun and, and the tally to Kadesh, and he went up with 10,000 men at his feet, and Deborah went up with him. And Barak called Zebulun and the tally to Kadesh. He collected that. He gathered. He mustered up 10,000 fighting men from among them. From, from among those two tribes of Israel that that was that had been tormented, ride-shotted over, that had been abused for over 20 years by these Canaanites. And that they followed him up to Mount Tabor, they all being infantry, footmen. For like I said earlier, Israel did not have no cavalry. And in spite of that, in spite of Syria having this great multitudes of iron chariots and horsemen and foot soldiers, that, that, that they got the victory over Syria's army. And we are told that Deborah went up with him and their army to the top of Mount Tabor to encourage him and them when, with her presence and to give her advice when to the, the sin and engage the enemy. God sent heard there with them so that to encourage them and to tell them when to move, when to engage, and, and, and to let them know that the Lord was with them. Now, today in our times that we live, we are not engaged in a warfare with physical enemies such as the Canaanites or the, or, or the Hittites. But then we also, as Christians, as children of God, that 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 we are to be led by the Spirit of God, and that and that to remember that we are to be encouraged, and that we are to have no doubts. We are not to fear that though we are seen to be that there is no physical enemies that. We have to face that, but there is a spiritual warfare that we are constantly in. And so, just as this new unit is talking about being strong, being courageous, and this lesson is talking about having no doubt, we as 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 the part of the body of Christ, as individual believers and collectively as the body of Christ, that we need to be mindful that 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 we are in a spiritual warfare and that we do not wrestle with a physical enemy, but we wrestle with spiritual weakness 
in high places and that and that and that we wrestle with 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 the enemy of Satan and then the enemy of of the sin nature, the academic nature. So we are told, we are told just as this unit explains for them to be strong, we to be strong. So we find in the word of God is that that we are to be aware of this and not to be fearful. But but we are told in Ephesians the sixth chapter verses ten, starting at verse ten, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That we are to put on the whole armor of God that we might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual weakness, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual weakness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole arm of God, that ye might be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all presence and supplications for all saints. And that we are to be strong. We are to be strong, not in ourselves, but we are to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. May God bless you and keep you.